so I'd like to commence just by making an acknowledgement um, of the unceded lands of Brisbane, which is where I come from, uh, and the traditional owners, the Turrbal, the Yagur, and the Gagara, as well as the Kwandamuka traditional owners of the seawater country that's to the east of Brisbane. So the paper's in three parts. Uh, in the first, I'll frame a question. In the second, I'll talk about a particular project that happened earlier this year in Eindhoven. And in the third, I'll launch from that into um, a reflection upon certain Dutch innovations in the globalization of European governance in the early modern period. Um, so as a brief explanation of that, uh, Frontier Imaginaries is an ongoing uh, research exhibition project that's had editions in Brisbane, Jerusalem, New York, Amsterdam, uh, and Eindhoven earlier this year. And so I must make thanks uh, with regard to that final part that I'll discuss today to my co-curators there, Charles Eschi and Annie Fletcher, as well as the research advisors, Denise Ferreira de Silva, Rachel O'Reilly, and Wendelin van Oldenborg. So as a kind of preface to the conversation, I don't know if anybody else follows these things, but today the sun is actually ingressing into Sagittarius. Uh, tomorrow there is a <laughs> Sag. I see a Sag in the background. Um, there's, uh, tomorrow there's a full moon, which will be in Gemini, which is actually the culmination of a really important lunar cycle, moving from uh, a new moon that was on the 7th of November that was in Scorpio. That was one day before Jupiter ingressed into Sagittarius for the first time in about 20 years. Um, Mercury ingressed into Sagittarius on the 31st of October, and on the 7th of December we'll have a new moon in Sagittarius as well. So it's quite, uh, and Sagittarius is the sign that's uh, traditionally associated with astrology. So in honor of that moment, uh, I wanted to read and to start with as a kind of an image to frame the conversation, some lines from uh, a recently translated text by the first century astrologer Vetius Valens. Um, and he gives a very important series of accounts of the rulerships of each of the planets. And they're given as a series of correspondences or associations. So I'll read first of all from Saturn. He says of Saturn, Saturn makes those born under him petty, malignant, careworn, self-depreciating, solitary, deceitful, secretive in their trickery, strict, downcast, with a hyper hypocritical air, squalid, black-clad, importunate, sad-looking, miserable, with a nautical bent and plying waterside trades. So Capricornians, that's you, basically. Um, but it's, it's very striking that he ends with these terms with a nautical bent and plying waterside trades. For a modern astrologer, that's profoundly counterintuitive because those are categories that one would immediately put together with Mercury because Mercury rules trade. So Valens of Mercury says, Mercury indicates education, letters, disputation, reasoning, brotherhood, interpretation, embassies, number, accounts, geometry, markets, youth, games, theft, association, communication, service, gain, discoveries, obedience, sport, wrestling, declamation, certification, supervision, weighing and measuring, the testing of coinage, hearing and versatility. He keeps going on. At a certain point, he says, Mercury makes weightlifters and mimes those making their livelihood with displays of skill, deception, gambling, and sleight of hand. He goes on and then concludes, of materials it rules copper and all coins used in buying and selling, for the god makes exchanges. So what can explain the association or the correspondence of a nautical bent and plying waterside trades with Saturn, who doesn't at all rule exchanges, but who in fact rules constraint and restriction? So further in Valens uh, correspondences for Saturn, he says Saturn causes violent deaths by water, strangulation, imprisonment, or dysentery. It also causes a falling on the face. So this initial uh, set of correspondences has been offered as a frame on the notion of boundaries, crossings, uh, and on the radical constraint of a water's edge. So the paper itself. So why within the field of contemporary art are we gathered to talk about heritage? And I'll start by playing a clip from a video that was prepared by the Cutterbing Film Collective. 
in 2015 when I nominated them for the Visible Award, which is a European prize celebrating uh, socially and politically charged art. So does that give us view? Uh, okay. I'm just playing about the first minute and a half. And is the sound, has the sound been adjusted? We decided to make a uh, association. <coughs> mean, hides out, but mean come coming together. When it comes in, coming together. Come in together. Yeah. Oh, my all right, fine. Yeah, we come in and say hello. Yeah, yeah. We're staying here tomorrow night, so keep an eye on him. An Aboriginal man has died in custody at a police station in central Darwin. Police confirmed that the 59-year-old was taken into custody for alcohol offences last night. <laughs> I refer to the 9.5 million cut to the Indigenous Languages Support Program. And it also gave us the flexibility to, in, to make, in, introduce new measures. I mentioned the residents of the Australian Ballet School. It needs to stop. So I hope you caught the final part of that video in which, uh, within a parliamentary uh, setting, the then Minister of the Arts is questioned by the opposition in terms of why um, a few million have been cut from Indigenous language programs to which he avers and then says that uh, fortunately an Australian Ballet Association uh, studio or something has been built. So the Carterbing Film Collective is a group of artist filmmakers from Australia's top end uh, who are one of the most enduring collaborators of Frontier Imaginaries. As an artist group, Karabing are connected by family ties. Uh, many Karabing members are Emmy Engel speaking, but not all. Uh, and along those lines of social complexity, Karabing does not conform to Australia's, the Australian state's ethnographic typologies of Indigenous title recognition. The name Karabing means tied out, which in part acknowledges a number of lineages up and down a coastline. Uh, while Karabing member Rex Edmonds also points out that the name Karabing can be thought of as meaning coming together, uh, interpreting the low tide not as low or empty, but as a time of gathering, when oysters and other coastal foods are plentiful revealed within the intertidal area. Rex has also spoken about Karabing's filmmaking practice in terms of an energetic operation. He uses the term charge em up battery, indicating the art and film practice as a collectivized, motivating, and resource initiating activity that has been tactically devised by the group as a mode of survivance in the wake of the sudden restrictions imposed on Indigenous life in Australia since 2007 onwards. The consequences of those restrictions play out in the cinema of, of Karabing that often features a psychedelic collision of layered realities. So in the 2016 film Wutta, for example, Karabing members play out the possible causes of a motorboat breakdown that left certain Karabing members stranded dangerously far from freshwater. Recalling the events later, one Karabing member, Trevor, argues that the events of the breakdown were caused by jealous ancestors who were punishing Karabing members for failing to visit their important sites. Another member, Jojo, argues that their savior from perishing altogether was the Christian God to whom they must pray for the betterment of their souls. While a third member, Rex, sees a world disciplined by rusted wiring, material scarcity, and faraway replacement parts. Throughout the film, these worlds converge uh, and issue forth hallucinatory interference patterns that the Karabing members must somehow collectively navigate. The video for the Visible Award that I showed the beginning of goes on to explain the collective methodology of Karabing's filmmaking, but what this initial portion uh, dramatizes are the consequences of a recent turn within Australian governance that corresponds to a turn within the governance of heritage. The shift corresponds to a number of social projects underway since the early 2000s in Australia, including the announcement of the end of multiculturalism, 
the rollback of indigenous land rights, radical innovations in border policing, including offshore detention, the repeal of the human rights of asylum seekers, a shift from welfare to workfare, and most recently, attacks on publicly funded broadcasting and on funding for contemporary art. In listing these things, I'm not concerned with causality, so I'm not pursuing uh, whether one causes an end of the other. What I'm interested in is an analytic of correspondence by which these things may be apprehended as going together in a particular constellation or dynamic relation. So Denise Ferreira de Silva uh, would discuss that as a fractal relation, calling upon a mathematical species of image in which it's possible to hone in on any particular part and to find there a continuing ex expression of a basic formula in repeating patterns. Elizabeth Povinelli has explored sim a similar proposition in her Symphony for Late Liberalism, uh, which we use throughout Frontier Imaginaries, and which charts political events as sonic notations, imagining history not as a timeline, but as a morphing sonic space. In order to capture this uh, formation, I draw upon an astrological notation, uh, notion sorry, of the constellation as a dynamic relation among planetary aspects, where a basic set of natal place placements may be affected by transits and manifest various expressions of a theme throughout a lifespan and beyond. In either approach, what is drawn forward in Karabing's video is the formation by which the mobilization of national borders and numerous internal frontiers corresponds also to a politics of heritage and the arts that enables an extinguishment of worlds. So Trademarkings was the fifth edition of Frontier Imaginaries taking place in Eindhoven and in partnership with the Van Abbe Museum earlier this year. It stood as a large scale exhibition that was orchestrated around three icons of commerce local to Eindhoven, the Falcon, the cigar and the computer chip. Its title, Trade Markings, was suggested by the research advisor, Denise Ferreira de Silva, in order to indicate exchanges that produce a kind of marking that is also a world making. The most important starting point for the project's conceptual framework uh, was when I visited the Eindhoven Municipal Archive, and the director there explained to me that Eindhoven, as it's known today, was, was, was established only at the end of the 1800s through manufacturing industries. And to make this point, he showed me some photographs of Eindhoven under construction that were strikingly reminiscent of photographs that I'm used to seeing of Brisbane under construction also in the 1800s. And it was at that point that I realized that Brisbane and Eindhoven in fact share a timeline of European modernity, whereas the cities surrounding Eindhoven emerged through an earlier modern timeline, for example, the Habsburg towns of Breda, Tilburg, and Den Bosch. Uh, when Carter Bing visited Eindhoven for research in 2017, I arranged a visit to the nearby Falconry and Cigar Museum of Valkensvaard that further helped to apprehend this stacking of modernities. The name Valkensvaard derives from a time uh, when the trained hunting falcon was a luxury item within European courtly society. From the 15th to the 18th centuries, Valkenwad was the epicenter of the European falconry trade, with a network that spanned from Coimbra to Stockholm and to Istanbul. Across the height of this trade, the falconers of Valkenswad were wealthy and well-connected families within a region that was otherwise inhabited by subsistence farmers and uh, beset by military occupation. The second part of the museum, the Cigar Makers Museum, tells the story of how this changed. By the mid-1800s, the business of falconry was no longer so lucrative. Instead, cigar factories had sprouted across the surrounding areas, including Valkensvard and Eindhoven, which was then a small village on the River Dommel. Having been under successive occupations throughout the 80 Years' War and the Golden Age, uh, the area's uh, economy was depressed, also with poor quality sandy soil, while the region's large Catholic families offered a generous supply of factory labor. The cigar factories largely involved a few dozen to a hundred workers at desks, laboring with hand tools, and Jack Steeles, who's uh, here in the picture, uh, explained to us via translation that he had worked in cigar factories from the age of 14 until his retirement at the age of 55, rolling 80 cigars an hour, six days a week. 
In the present time, the economy of the region is led by high-tech industry and electromagnetic lithography. Although little known outside of Eindhoven, the footprint of this industry is staggering, effectively accountable for the microchips of 80% of the smartphones internationally. That's huge. Um, so <laughs> for this you know, little known area, local officials have declared the region the Netherlands' brain port, aligning its economic vitality with Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport and Rotterdam's Seaport Harbour. The region is led by the ASML Corporation, which was formed when the Philips Electronics Factory shed, thank you darling, uh, shed 45,000 local manufacturing jobs in the early 1990s, shifting its operations to locations such as Taiwan, Mexico, and uh, Suzhou, west of Shanghai. I apologize for the pronunciation. Uh, a Philip Research Lab uh, investigating semiconductor lithography was also placed on the market at that time and became ASML when it merged with the Advanced Semiconductor Materials International Corporation. At the core of ASML's lucrative success is intellectual property. Since the early 2000s, Eindhoven is often ranked among the top of the OECD's patent intensity lists and in 2013, it held the first place, with 22.6 patents published per 10,000 residents each year. The product of ASML is as much the patent as it is electrolithography machines, and its business model hinges upon an internationally sourced workforce of highly trained engineers whose task it is to trademark as corporate secrets areas of imagined technological innovation. So these three icons of commerce inscribe worlds that are of Eindhoven, but that are also far beyond. The Falcon is always in dialogue with lands to the east of Europe, where falconry was developed, uh, in the Middle East and even further in Mongolia. And the Peregrine Falcon itself migrates annually to the south of the Sahara. Uh, tobacco smoking has its origins as a Mesoamerican practice, while the outer leaves of the cigars rolled in Eindhoven and Valkensvaard were sourced from plantations in Dutch colonial Sumatra. In the present day, the semiconductor is part of a long and cybernetically mediated economic chain from rare earth metals to handheld devices. Where are we up to? The Otolith Group's contribution to trademarking's poli sci deftly rendered the stacked nature of these worlds, the worlds of feathers, smoke, and semiconductors, the mercantile, the industrial, and the cybernetic. PolySci layered two components, a wallpaper of magnified nanoscale computer chips and a live feed of falcons roosting upon the rooftop of ASML's landmark Tower 8. The Odalith Group's uh, project in this work was to render apprehensible the invisible infrastructure of cybernetic globality by drawing upon avant-garde notions of denaturalization rather than iconography, by which they had in mind at once the celebrity screen portraits of uh, screen prints of Andy Warhol, as well as the corporate iconography of the trademark logo. The basic technology of electromagnetic lithography is actually no different from screen printing. It is only ASML's vectorally shrinking print scale that sets it apart from Warhol's analog counterpart. So across this stack, the worlds of feathers, smoke, and semiconductors, a number of contributions across trade markings bore witness to a double-sided relation of property and exchange that was often expressed through an aesthetics of transparency and opacity, and that cut transversely through the three stations of the exhibition. Ryan Presley, for example, is an artist whose work has traveled with Frontier Imaginary since its first edition. In Jerusalem, the allegorical nature of his oil and tempera on board paintings had come to the fore. In particular, his work on Crown Land, which is pictured here, in which an icon of St. George is modified to convey the incommensurabilities of indigenous life in the Northern Territory, and the scenario in which a heroic archetype of the political may not only fail, but may reproduce harm. Within trademarkings, however, the ambivalence of pattern within Ryan's work came to the fore. The painting Fair Coin Zero Sum, which is the one here, 
depicts Australian coins as well as basics and Inju electronic payments cards tumbling through the air. The basics and Inju cards are a recent innovation in Australian workfare that restricts the items upon which Indigenous people are able to spend social security funds. The basics card was first uh, introduced in remote communities, remote Indigenous communities, and has since been rolled out to non-Indigenous uh, Australians. While social scientists such as Sharon Wright, Greg Marsden, and Catherine MacDonald have demonstrated that the workfare policies developed for Indigenous Northern Territory communities were mobilised as prototypes for later UK austerity programs. Like squat anti squat, the composition of uh, fair coin, sorry, sorry, don't worry about that. The composition of fair coin uh, zero sum portrays a double world, one above and below. In the upper part of the board, where the hard currency falls, the background pattern appears stable and continuous. In the lower part of the composition, where the payment cards fall, a frog reveals that the pattern is in fact a sieve, a one-way device that permits the flow of value from some areas and its retention in others, accumulation here and depletion there. One of the new artists to Frontier Imaginaries in Eindhoven was the Dutch artist Marcel van den Berg, who contributed four large, not quite square canvases that are together titled And We Almost Lost. The work was inspired in 2013 when the city of Detroit filed for bankruptcy in the United States' largest municipal debt case to that time. Hearing the news, uh, Marcel could not separate his thoughts from Detroit's musical traditions, from the blues, jazz, R&B, soul, funk, techno and hip-hop that had been profound in his life and that often fills his studio as he works. Marcel's response was developed over the following four years as the canvases were placed variously on his studio walls, on the studio floor and occasionally in the park outside. Their compositions emerge gradually as fields of rhythm and material exposure, accumulated through collage, dirt, and roughly applied paint in shades from tar to black, uh, tar black to gold. The abstraction of And We Almost Lost is a meditation upon concretion, upon illegitimate opacity, and upon the value paradox of Detroit's black cultural riches. There are another six very clear examples throughout Frontier Imaginaries, I mean, without, throughout trademarking, sorry, of artworks that dramatize, critique, and seek to circumvent the double-sided paradox of value. For the purposes of this paper, I will mention just one more, which was the exhibition's temporary uh, Eindhoven Hip Hop Archive. During the 1990s, and the time that the Philips Corporation was having its global restructure, Eindhoven and its nearby region uh, was a significant hub for the reception of New York's hip hop culture into Europe through a convergence of young fans and an older generation of art collectors. Trade markings presented a gathering of flyers, letters, photographs and records from that time, as well as artworks by New York subway artists including Blade, Dondi White and Ramelzy, all of whom visited Eindhoven and nearby Helmond numerous times in the 90s. In their aesthetic tactics, these works are closely aligned with the Odolith group's jamming of iconicity and denaturalization, professing a deep awareness of a world bound by code. Ramelzy's We the People, uh, from the collection of Henk Pinenberg, pictured here, stages a hack of the United States uh, Constitution as a neurological circuit, diagramming the artist's vision of semiotic warfare through the art style of Gothic panzerism, which is what uh, Ramelzy preferred to call graffiti, which he thought was a term that devalued the art as rubbish writing. So over the exhibition's opening and showtime this year from April to July, the falcon roosting in ASML's Tower 8 and live streamed into the exhibition through the work of the Odolith group, brooded and hatched a clutch of four eggs. Where within the stack of global modernities, mercantile, industrial, and cybernetic, and amid the aesthetic and material battles over the parts of value that have no part, do these falcons make their existence? That's just a beautiful photo I wanted to show you. That's the uh, contemporary falconers from Falcons Vard and the uh, Katabing Film Collective with their first major installation work. So over the year leading up to trade markings, I developed an obsession with two permanent artworks within the foyer of the Van Abbe Museum's old building. 
that became an obsession with the category of the natural within the early mercantile modernity of the Netherlands. The first is a piece of heraldic masonry uh, featuring a lion rampart, standing erect and in profile with raised forepaws. As a legendary and supreme predator, the lion is a common charge in European heraldry. Nonetheless, the particular appearance of the lion throughout the historical Netherlands is particularly notable. Uh, the lion appears in the coat of arms of the provinces of Brabant, Flanders, Friesland, Gelderland, Holland, Limburg, Luxembourg, Lamour, Zeeland, as well as the House of Orange, which was the de facto royal, became the royal family of the Netherlands. Amid the 80 years Dutch War of Independence from Habsburg, Spain, a figurative mapping of the 17 provinces emerged as a lion uh, representing an image of unity and a propaganda tool. This mapping of the Leo Belgicus, or the Dutch lion, first appeared in 1583, shortly following the Union of Utrecht that declared the Rebel Republic. Its marshalling of the provinces of the Netherlands into a graphic and imagined whole emblematized one of the core achievements of the Republic, the unprecedented uh, achievement in Europe of convincing seven separate provinces to conceive of a common cause to arms beyond the defense of their sovereign counties and without the figurehead of a crown. The second feature is a fresco uh, produced in 1936 by the Dutch artist Dirk Nyland. Born in 1881, amid the belated industrial era in the Netherlands, Nyland's work turned repeatedly throughout his career to the sea islands and estuarine terrain of the southern province of Zeeland as a kind of Dutch sea pastoral. While a title for the work is not available in the museum archive, a pamphlet inaugurating the building's opening in 1936 cites the fresco as an elemental invocation, conflating the principle of water with the fresco's image of a dark, forbidding, and uncontainable sea. As an allegory of Dutch modernity, the lion and the sea couple and recede in a mise en abeam of paradoxical relays. The lion emblematizes, sorry, yes, emblematizes a paradigm of transparency, a predatory vision from which all is apprehensible and available. In its iconicity as a figure of the territorial sovereign, the lion also claims a legitimate opacity, the right and capacity to repel external interference. And this, uh, this line's actually uh, a snapshot that I took within the Hong Kong Maritime Museum here nearby. And it is a uh, 17th century, uh, what do you call it, like front end of a, of a VOC ship. Um, the lion in the Van Abbe Museum was in fact installed in the 1940s as well under Nazi occupation and under the authority of a collaborating local mayor. The original uh, masonry had been an Ouroboros, which can be made out in the original museum pamphlet image. So you can see there's sort of a circle above the, above the doorway there. So the companion to the lion as an image of the power of nature, the sea, emblematizes that which is beyond the bounds of property. The sea is not, however, a transparent and receptive ideal of water. The boundless sea is opaque, its waters are pelagic, which is to say that they do not touch the sides, they are uncontained. Whatever transparency the waters of the sea might offer in pure opportunity, they match equally in pure risk, in the unforeseeable. So legally, the foundational text in establishing a modern European imaginary of incommensurably opposed land and sea is Mare Liberum prepared by the Dutch Latinist and statesman Hugo de Groot, or Grotius in the Latinate, and published anonymously in 1609 in an effort to influence the negotiations of the 12 years truce with Spain. Within Mare Liberum, uh, a conjunction of piracy, Pacific Asian affairs, rule of or over the seas, and a matter of truce in Europe hinge upon one fundamental question whether or not free trade could be seen to be so fundamental to human nature as to be in accord with God's will and thereby the divine law of nature. When one considers that the treatise was commissioned by the Zeeland Chamber of Commerce of the Dutch East India Company as a defense of piracy, uh, it is not a surprise that Grotius both posed the problem in this way and found in the affirmative. The full title of the text is, is uh, I'll give the English, not the Latin, The Free Seas or a Dissertation on the Right that Belongs to the Dutch to Engage in the Indies Trade. 
Commenced in 1603, Mary Le Brome was originally one chapter of a much larger treatise, and again, I'll give the English uh, translation, which is Commentary on the Law of Booty. And there's something terrific about the original Lacenic vocabulary of piracy. Uh, it's, the, the Latin is iura prede, predation. You know, there's this economic vocabulary that's been whitewashed that's present here in these uh, 17th century texts. As a segment within the broader text, Murray Le Burham hones in upon the events surrounding the seizure by the VOC under the Admiral Van Heemskirk of the Portuguese carrack, the Santa Catarina. Uh, within the waterways between Singapore, the, what is today the island of Singapore, and the kingdom of Johor. Uh, I must note that my understanding of this text and the events surrounding it is indebted to Peter Borschberg's book, Hugo Grotius, The Portuguese and Free Trade in the East Indies which is published through National University of Singapore Press. By Grotius' account, three vessels of the VOC were, uh, it's in 1604, uh, we're in 1604 in the Singapore Straits, okay, and three vessels of the VOC who've survived the journey have gotten there, and they're about to set sail to return to Europe when they were approached by the king of Johor through his younger brother, the Raja Bongsu, with an announcement that Johor was open to trade with the Dutch. Receiving this news, uh, the Portuguese Estadio de India sent their own emissary to the king, seeking to dissuade their engagement with the Dutch and threatening war if they proceeded. <coughs> According to Grotius, the, Joh Joh the Johor king rebuffed the Portuguese, who equipped with three warships and four or five foists that ravaged settlements along the coast of Johor, massacred civilians, laid siege to the capital city. Uh, the Dutch were then called upon to help repel the Portuguese, according to the Dutch, uh, and it was in this context that the Santa Catarina was taken captive by the Dutch and by its flagship that was called the White Lion, the Vitellio. Upon returning to Europe, the Santa Catarina's cargo of rich trades from Japan and China was sold at twice the paid-in capital of the VOC at the time, inflaming the Northern European imagination of the fortunes to be gained in long-distance maritime trade, while Portugal protested and demanded the return of the appropriated wealth. In writing Mari Liberum, Grotius was serving a commission by the VOC to provide a legal basis upon which the seizure of the Santa Catarina could be claimed not to be an act of piracy. Grotius's resolution of this problem issued a radical break with the existing global order of the 16th century, albeit by appropriating existing theological ethical tools from the Spanish late scholastics. Until Mari Liberum, European transcontinental maritime expansion had been sanctioned through Mare Clausum, closed seas, with the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans apportioned to the jurisdiction of Spain and Portugal through papal bull, and with the justification of colonial dominium staked through the principles of discovery and first occupation, terra nullius, which is from Roman law. So effectively, sea was given to be equivalent to territory, was available to be owned by sovereign entities. So prior to Grotius's critique of uh, this uh, dominium, uh, a critique had been raised from within Spain itself. The late scholastics of the School of Salamanca had summoned natural law in the late 1500s in response to the atrocities of the Spanish conquest in the Americas. Finnish legal scholar Marti Koskienemi points out that Francisco de Vitoria, the prima professor of the Salamanca School, was under no illusions as to the ethical burden that the Spanish were bringing home with them across the seas. Koskienemi's account tells the story of the Salamanca theologians hearing accounts of violence through the confession of conquistadors upon their return to Spain, citing a letter from Vitoria in 1534 in which the professor wrote that the stories of conquistador behavior in Peru of that year, quote, freezes the blood in my veins. Uh, and this, I show this etching, um, particularly because it was actually produced by Flemish artists from Antwerp who had fled the Spanish persecution in Antwerp to the Netherlands. And so there was a certain alignment rhetorically that was being produced of um, the overbearing uh, occupations of Alva and of the Spanish um, in this context. So faced with an ethical crisis, the sin of unjust war, the Salamanca theologians set out to establish a renewed and just basis of the colonial project. The resolution was achieved by reaching above the authority of Roman and papal law, 
and calling to the higher principles of divine will uh, as expressed uh, through the Thomas principle of eos communicationis or the right to free and unimpeded communication. So the Salamankan argument expanded upon the principle that, the so that sociability is so fundamental to humankind as to be in accord with divine will itself. Uh, Vittoria, particularly in his Relaciones of 1557 and 1564, as well as his Relazione on the Indies, construed this innate sociability as a right of the Spanish to evangelize in the New World, acting with the benevolence uh, to include into God's grace innocent non-believers who dwelt without the benefit of the gospel. Uh, by Vittoria's reason, the conquistadors would have the benefit to the common goods of the earth, res communitas, also given under natural law, and would have the right to wage public war if they were obstructed in this mission. So Grotius's contribution through Mare Liberum did not fundamentally alter this basic theological argument. Borschberg makes, uh, makes the claim or makes the argument that what Grotius did effectively was to transfer a juridical apparatus developed for the Spanish Americas to the East Indies and to the service of the Dutch Imperial Project. Grotius' principal innovation then was to sharpen and commercialize Vittoria's extroverted principle of sociality and to endow it with the mercantile imperative of free trade as the means to just war. His argument, in effect, was that trade is such a fundamental character of humankind that it is in accord with God's will that the Dutch should have passage over free seas to the Indies, where they should have free access to the Emporia, fortified with the right to public war wherever this freedom was obstructed. The paradox of natural law appears in the formulation of a freedom enforceable through power of arms. And from the outset of the Dutch maritime empire, Grotius insisted that arms were the ultimate guarantor of free trade. From the perspective of the East Indies kingdoms, this warring imperative would soon be deployed not against the Portuguese, but against their own powers. Through the strict enforcement of pactus on servanda, contracts must be honored. From the point of view of a politics of heritage, a crucial aspect of this drama is that the globalization of natural law corresponded to a winnowing down of the expression of human sociality, from an understanding of human intercourse in its most encompassing meanings, materially, politically, sexually, economically, spiritually. The principle of sociality was delimited first to an extroverted mi missionary program by Vittoria, and then to an expression of trade by Grotius. The result is encapsulated in the Dutch Golden Age ideal of Mercatus Sapiens, or the wise merchant, as proposed by the theologian Caspar van Baaler, or Baleus in the Latinate, uh, which he made in his 1636 opening lecture at the Amsterdam Athenaeum, Amsterdam's first institute of higher learning and the precursor to the University of Amsterdam. The professorship had originally actually been offered to Grotius, uh, but he was later transferred to Baleus when Grotius was forced to flee the Republic. So I'll just read quickly from Baleus' human argument that the merchant is one who is ruled by Mercury and who is elevated by Mercury in his knowledge of the world through trade. So Baleus wrote, in my opinion, when the ancients call upon a god of buying and selling, they do not ask the oppositional Mars, nor the faint Venus, nor the narrow-minded Luna, nor the laughable one Vulcan, but the wisest of all gods, Mercury, the creator of wisdom and eloquence, as he is the one who must confer to the merchants their needed wisdom and eloquence, first in order to gain fair profits and to distinguish from unfair, and the second through the seduction of their words, to be able to praise those things that they are eagerly trying to sell. Baleas goes on to emphasize the material dimension of the Mercatus sapiens uh, edified knowledge through the products of the world, and he offers a litany. They learn of the Indian's ivory, of the Arab's incense, of the Persian silk, of the Moluccan spices, of the American's gold and silver, and it goes on. Uh, Mercury as the correspondent between the gods and the mortal world is the ruler of boundary crossings and transgressions of all kinds. As Valens wrote, the god rules exchanges. In contrast to Baleus's exalted view of Mercury, the planet's rulership includes not only correspondences of merchants, roads, and eloquence, but of thieves, trickery, and sleight of hand. So elsewhere, I'm developing a reading of the curator as an ideal mercurial figure within this vein. 
Uh, but here and in closing, I would just like to recall the Kadabing Film Collective and their meaning of the name Tied Out in asking by what means to the modern world it might be possible to apprehend the wisdom to know the water's edge as a water's edge.